today we're going to talk about how to write, uh, translate basically scientific writing into something that your attorney can use to prepare uh, legal documents. And so just some background, Raju has already talked about this, but uh, scientific literature and specifically individuals who have dedicated a lot of their career to their expertise in the scientific uh, realm, so to say, um, it's it's very difficult to, the, it doesn't directly translate into legal documents or easily digestible information. Um, so what we are wanting to do is to provide some tips and tricks, maybe some insight as to how we use the information or how it best translates for us so that we can uh, create documents more easily and more accurately, honestly. Clear communication is one of the best ways to accurately convey and represent our clients. So the more that we can understand the specifics of the scientific projects or research or career that is going on, the better we can represent our clients. So when you're writing or conveying your information to your attorney or just non-scientific people in general, some key steps to follow include knowing your audience, um, so, you know, if you know that they don't have a strong background, then, you know, adapt. And anyway, so know your audience, relate your research to something that they understand, show the relevance of your research, and don't use too much scientific jargon. Make your writing interesting, use illustrations where you can, and maybe have a non-scientist review your work. So knowing your audience means that Having an understanding of who will be receiving your presentation, your writing, the information that you're providing. And scientific jargon can get in the way of that sometimes because if you're speaking to somebody who just doesn't have any background, it, it gets lost in translation. Think of a foreign language and the barriers that come happen when two different languages are trying to come together. So that's one way that I think about it when I'm explaining it. Um, and just having a strong understanding of your audience will just assure that they get the most out of what you're trying to say. There's a lot of interesting work and a lot of interesting information that can get lost in translation. So knowing your audience, knowing how much they may know going into the, you know, reading or reviewing the information plays a big factor. So if you can relate your research to something that the audience understands, it's going to make it more digestible to them. It's going to make it less overwhelming and it's going to be something that maybe has a lasting impact. And so we suggest using analogies or metaphors or comparisons. So for example, if you were to say that the cell membrane is a protective structure that surrounds all cells like the walls of a house, it separates the cell's internal and external environments. Therefore, the cell membrane contains proteins which act as gates determining what molecules can, can and cannot enter the cell. You've taken something very complex and very difficult and turned it into something that people understand. They know what a house is. They know what gates are. They understand internal and external. And it just made something, you don't leave somebody, you know, three pages back confused on what cell membrane means. And so you bring them along with you as you go. And that helps when you are created, able to create a relation to something that is in their everyday life. So explaining the relevance of your research, that helps people say, you know, why, why should I care? And it's not that people aren't interested generally, but sometimes people have short attention span. And if you don't keep them engaged throughout the entire writing, it, it's easy to get confused and miss key factors. So uh, always keep it relevant. And one example of explaining the relevance to your research could look like this. It says, I investigate how proteins and cells must fold. The different structures that proteins have when they fold incorrectly can cause a variety of diseases depending on the protein, including like cystic fibrosis, Pyron disease, and Parkinson's disease. Understanding what causes proteins to misfold is a stepping stone to understanding these diseases and developing test 
treatments for them in the future. So you've taken something very complex. I don't know what it means for a protein to fold. How do proteins fold? You know, when I think of protein, I think of maybe the foods I consume. But here we're talking on a molecular level. And it, instead of it being extremely overwhelming, it gives a purpose. We know what cystic fibrosis generally is. We know what Parkinson's generally is. We hear about these diseases within our community and at you know, different medical researches. So we kind of have an idea that they're illnesses and having the relevance stated like this helps keep your audience engaged and gives a purpose. Yeah, say, hey, you know, this is really interesting. So that is helpful when you're writing for non-scientific people. So scientific jargon can be inevitable. There are certain things that we just have to use the scientific terminology for, but there's ways to maybe think about things differently so that we can also use lay terms. That way the research isn't totally feeling like a scientific dictionary for those of us who may have to look up maybe three words in one sentence. That is a lot and can get really uh, just hectic and cumbersome so that you spend so much time trying to remember the, the definitions that you look up that you forget the purpose of the research or what it even, what the research even may be. Uh, so, for example, in the non-scientific person's world, BMI means body, body mass index, but it can also mean brain-machine interface to a neuroscientist. So, if I'm going through an article and I keep seeing BMI that hasn't been defined as brain-machine interface, I'm going to be going through a neurological article thinking, oh my gosh, how does body mass index fit into this neuroscience, if they're talking about uh, different neurological research, why are they talking about BMI, body mass index? So it's just helpful. It's helpful to think about your reader and to consider their maybe the knowledge that they may have going into it. If you don't know, chances are for if you're talking to attorneys or if you're talking to people outside of the industry directly, I would assume minimal background knowledge. And just keep it, we say about, about a 12-year-old, if you can speak to a 12-year-old about the subject, think about it that way. And that's not to call people, you know, it, it's just a lack of experience in that realm. People have dedicated their entire career to their scientific endeavors, and it's, it's just not really realistic to expect the world around you to inherently understand such complexity. Using illustrations is one of my favorite ways to uh, loop people in. If I'm reading something and I see a little uh, table graph or something, it, it just helps me conceptualize and visualize what I've just read. And it's not saying that illustration should be overused, but there are times that it's extremely helpful to use a graph or a table. And it sort of breaks up the reading. It also provides the reader a place to check in and say, okay, I did understand that, or wait, this doesn't look anything like what I thought um, I just read. So illustrations can be a helpful tool if used appropriately. This is perhaps one of my uh, most valuable tips that I could offer is that if you have a non-scientist review your writing, it can be, it can go a long way. There's times that, you know, I write things even if I'm trying to break something out and, and think about it differently, maybe in a non-legal realm, uh, there's times that I find a lot of value in seeking a, an opinion of somebody who could be part of that audience. So maybe a friend or family member or just somebody who's not deeply immersed in the field that you're presenting on. Uh, they can talk to you about if they get uninterested, if you lose them, if they feel like, it, hey, you know, I lost relevance from page two to four, and then it took me another three paragraphs to get back engaged. Um, that's helpful feedback. It also can let you know if you're utilizing a term that hasn't been properly defined, or maybe it's just way too much to look up. Um, it's really helpful, and they can help you summarize. They can provide a summary that maybe you say, hey, in two sentences, what did I say? What is my, you know, 
what is the conclusion of my research? Uh, that, you know, that feedback is extremely helpful. It lets you know if you've been clear, concise, and if you are going to be misunderstood. Making your writing interesting can just go a long way. And being straight to the point is one part of that. Uh, instead of like scientific research can, can often reflect um, maybe what happened and how you did it. Uh, but it doesn't always show like, some of the things that as an attorney that we need to know about research is maybe why it motivates you. Why does this project matter in like the economic realm or why does it matter to, you know, the greater good of society or um, things like that? Uh, there's time that there's times that, getting your passion through can be really beneficial for helping your attorney or person representing you to maybe have a better understanding of your research. And you may want to leave out details uh, that would lose the attention of your readers. So getting too far deep into your methods is an easy way to lose your reader. Now in the scientific realm, you, you really want to you know, expand upon your method because that's a lot of times what the scientific um, industry can be very interested in is your methodology more so than even the conclusion at times. So think about that. Um, we like to know the methods, but it's often not exactly relevant to, especially the NIW. Um, so just keep that in mind. Um, simplify maybe where you can and we like to think about it as um, maybe an inverted pyramid. And you can begin with the conclusion and say, hey, you know, this is what we found and or this is the main point of my research. This is what I'm trying to do. Uh, think about important details, but don't get too far in the weeds. And then conclude with the background, maybe reminding them of the relevancy or the purpose or the major, um, major need that's being met by this research. And so that just ties it back to together and creates a nice little package that's very cohesive for a non-scientific person to digest. Yeah.